May there be peace in the plants, in the trees, and in animals. May there be peace in the hearts of all beings. May there be peace in everyone and in everything. Sarvetra Sukhina Santu Sarve Santu Niramayaha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makas Chetukha Bhag Bhavet Sarvas Tarato Durgani Sarvo Bhadrani Pashyatu Sarvas Sad Bhutimap Noto Sarvas Sarvatra Nandato May all be happy and healthy. May all see what is good and may no one experience misery. May all overcome their obstacles and acquire good tendencies. May people everywhere find joy and fulfillment. Now, let us spend some time touching the center of peace and joy in our hearts. A good way to begin the practice is to withdraw the scattered energies of the mind and bring them to rest on one point. That point can be our own breathing. Let us therefore practice breathing with awareness. As we breathe in, let us visualize that our body and mind are being filled with love, strength and compassion. And as we breathe out, let us release all the stress, anxiety and exhaustion in the body and mind. Let us practice this way for a while. Let us now turn our attention to the region of our heart. Although God is present everywhere and in everyone, the Divine Presence can be felt most clearly in our own hearts. We can meditate in any way we have been taught. To remain focused, we can take the help of a short mental prayer or a mantra or a Divine Name. Let us now spend some time 
dwelling on the presence of God in our hearts. Shanti 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 Hari Hi Om Thank you.
ओम असतोमा सत्कमय तमसोमा ज्योतिर्गमय मृत्योर्मा अमृत गमय आविरावीर्मगे रुद्रयत्ते दक्षिण मुखम तेन मां पाहि नित्यम मे द डिवाइन लीड अस फ्रॉम द अनरियल टू द रियल फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट फ्रॉम डेथ टू इमोर्टैलिटी विद द डिवाइन कॉन्शियसनेस फिल अवर हार्ट्स एंड प्रोटेक्ट अस अ टॉपिक टुडे इज द बेसिक्स ऑफ मेडिटेशन some of us have been meditating for years and some may be new to meditation but the topic nevertheless is of relevance to all even to those who have been meditating for some time it's always helpful no matter how familiar we are with a certain practice to occasionally go back to the basics some of you are familiar with uh, with George George Dwyer who was our long time Vedanta student he passed away a few years ago he led our Vedanta music for many years so he was my first uh, driving instructor so he taught me driving in in Marshfield where we had a retreat place and um, so he gave me all the preliminary lessons and then asked me to join a regular uh, driving school uh, and anyway so i mentioned this only because he told me although he had been by then driving for decades so he said the first snow of every season so when there is the first snow he said he would take the car out to the the parking lot of the nearest mall in that area and he said just turn around and apply brakes just to get familiar with the wintry conditions that would be what coming and that he did even though he was a very very experienced driver and therefore even though we may have been meditating for some time it's helpful to go to the best basics and just kind of kind kind of a refresher course so there are these three terms that we need to just look at first uh, concentration meditation and contemplation concentration is seen as the source of all knowledge if i need to get knowledge about something my mind must be focused on that thing swami vivekananda had this to say on concentration he said all knowledge we have either of the external or internal world is obtained through only one method by the concentration of the mind no knowledge can be had of any science unless we can concentrate our minds upon the subject if you want to study your own mind it will be the same process you will have to concentrate your mind and turn it back upon itself the difference in this world between mind and mind is simply the fact of concentration one more concentrated than the other gets more knowledge so while we use the mind to get knowledge about things to get knowledge about the mind itself the mind has to kind of turn back upon itself now concentration on a specific scriptural passage was what meditation was understood to be for a long time so generally when we spoke about meditation it meant studying or reading a passage from a scripture and then with a focused mind reflecting on what that passage meant and that was the word the word that was used for that practice was meditation and then there is contemplation so what generally today we mean by meditation the word that was used for a long time was contemplation now that subtle distinction between contemplation and meditation has pretty much evaporated now so meditation has become a a catch all world word for for pretty much concentrating the mind on anything 
So, I mean, even concentrating on the mind on one's own breath, breathing with awareness, I mean, that's a very useful practice. Mindfulness is the word that is increasingly being used today. Now, that's a very helpful practice, but, but just focusing on the breath is, to call it a meditation is kind of, I mean, that's how the word, the meaning of the word has stretched quite a lot today. Because in the Vedantic tradition, strictly speaking, meditation as a process always will have a spiritual ideal or God as the focus of one's attention. Because if I have to realize God, if I have to realize my own true nature, then that must be the object of my concentration. So if I'm concentrating my, on my breath, I will realize my breath, but, but, but realizing my breath is no enlightenment. In some. It's a helpful practice. So I'm, I'm just mentioning this to show how meditation has become a, a very uh, of a broad spectrum word. People speak about walking meditation, tea meditation, and that's great. That's, that's very helpful. But, but to kind of recognize the restrictive meaning of the term and then the, this broad spectrum way the word gets used today. One other important question that we have to ask is why should we meditate at all? And in fact, I've had over the years people come and ask me why I should meditate. And when someone asks me like that, I just say, no, you don't have to. I mean, it's, I don't see it as my responsibility to somehow like a, like a salesmanship to make people meditate. Uh, so, so if someone says why I should meditate, my answer is no, you don't have to. What I do also say is that if we know what meditation can do for me, then, then we would want to meditate ourselves with no pressure from outside. For instance, none of us asks why I should breathe. Well, we know breathing my whole life depends on it. Um, if I don't, if I stop breathing, I won't live. And so why I should breathe is never a question that comes. Or why I should eat or why I should drink water. Well, we might be able to live without eating or drinking for some time, we know that if we stop it altogether, we won't survive. But we know that if we don't meditate, or if we stop meditating altogether, we don't die really, physically. In fact, a good number of people don't, don't meditate at all. And they seem to be doing just fine. Seem to be, seem to be is, a, is a key word, I think. But even though physically we might not die if we don't have an inner spiritual practice, but something within us does die. Something that is so subtle, so tan uh, intangible, that we may not even know that it exists if we are not sensitive enough. But the effect of that something within us, which remains undernourished, are seen through the stress, anxiety, the fear of the unknown, the suspicion, the distrust that, that take away our peace and joy in life. Oftentimes we take it as a given that to, to have some kind of a stress or an anxiety, that is just how life is. And so, we don't necessarily treat that as a symptom that something is not right. In fact, there, I, I have known a few people, I'm sure many of you might have also. There was several times I have had people say, oh, I, I just feel so happy nowadays. I don't have any stress. Is something wrong with me? So that's the thing. The, we have gotten so used to living a stressful existence that on those few occasions or stretches of time when we may be without stress, people begin to wonder whether there is something wrong with them. So the primary benefit of meditation 
the word that gets often used in Vedanta text is God realization. Now, the word realization can be understood in, in any number of ways. Um, I like to understand it simply by God realization means God becomes real to me. And when will something become real to me? As long as I need to believe in something, I need to have faith in something, it hasn't really become real to me. When something is very real, we don't generally use the word faith or, or belief. I, for instance now, I, I don't have to say, I have faith that this object is in my hand, or I believe it's in my hand. No, I can feel it, I can see it, I experience it directly. And so the word God realization, or sometimes the word self-realization, uh, really means making these abstract, intangible, transcendent realities really real, so that faith or belief matures into direct experience. Now, meditation is something that can give us that highest experience. And the secondary benefits of Meditation are good health, peace of mind, good sleep, uh, a relatively uncluttered mind, if we meditate well, and a good conscience. <laughs> meditation done primarily for, for good health and good sleep, removal of stress, etc., is, is a secular meditation. I mean, we might, again, if you really want to stretch the meaning of the word meditation, it's good to classify it this way. If I ask myself why I want to meditate, and if I, all that I can think of is, oh, it'll give me good sleep, or it'll give me some peace of mind, I'll just feel happy about it, then that's fine. But since the object, the goal of a meditation is good sleep, or good health, then we can call it a secular meditation. If the goal is mental peace and clarity, good conscience, we can call it ethical meditation. And that which has it for its goal, God realization, or realizing the highest spiritual truth, then we can call it uh, a spiritual meditation. Only if meditation has that spiritual focus, only then can we truly call it a spiritual practice. Again, as I have often said, the word spiritual itself has become quite diluted. Um, anything that is a little bit uplifting, a, a beautiful sunrise or a sunset, or some nice music, oh, that's so spiritual. Uh, I think sometimes we just, uh, yeah, the, the word itself kind of become meaningless after some time. So again, to go to the root meaning of the term, rather than applying the word spiritual anywhere and everywhere, we can say, if something is directly related to the spirit, something beyond this world of material entities, something that is transcendent, then I think it will be more accurate to use the word spiritual. So if we believe that whatever we are doing is a spiritual practice, we again, it's good to kind of go back and say, what is the goal, the prayer, the meditation that I do, or whatever I feel is the, my religious practice, why am I really doing it? And I think good to ask that question. Now, guidance in, in meditation is helpful in practicing because inevitably, as we begin any practice, there are inevitable questions, there are doubts, there are um, obstacles. And if someone who is uh, familiar with that path, and that person then can help us navigate our life in spiritual, spiritual life. So that is another one question that also gets asked. Do I need a teacher in, to learn meditation? Swami Brahmananda, great disciple of Ramakrishna, was once asked a similar question. Is there a need for guru in life? And then he simply said, even if you have to learn how to pick pockets, you need someone to teach you. And so for, we never question the, the wisdom of going to school and learning from our teachers or professors. But only when it comes to spiritual practice, we somehow seem to think 
I don't need anybody. I can do it on my own. Now, it's true. It's not that you cannot. If you go out into the bookstores now, there are really hundreds of books on meditation. It's possible to pick, pick any of them, and they're, well, any of them, those who are authentic books. Um, and most practices might bring some benefit. But those who want to take, take up meditation as an earnest, deep spiritual practice think they are better off not depending simply on books. It's a little bit like if there are any health issues we have, just simply cough and cold or stuff like that. We don't always necessarily have to go to the emergency. We can go to CVS and pick up something. So just like there are uh, over-the-counter medications, we don't need any teacher for that. Um, even if you have to go to a doctor, again, it's, it's helpful if we have a PCP who is who we have been with for some time, who has, knows our medical history, then that person will be in a better position to help me than if I go to a, a different doctor every day, who still might be able to help me with their knowledge, but, but someone who, who knows me better would be able to help me in a better way. So that's the general principle behind requiring a teacher in one's spiritual practice. Now, meditation as a practice also, it's not something that, oh, I want to meditate and boom, I start practicing today. It, if we really want to do it well, then we need to prepare ourselves for it. And a healthy, to make the mind healthy is the first and foremost requirement to, for success in meditation. And the practice of karma yoga, practice of doing selfless work, a work without any selfish motive, a work done purely because you believe it to be good, or believe it to be right, or a work done that is done out of love for God, as an offering to God. So whatever work we do in life, if that is done as an expression of our love for God, that goes to purify our heart. If we do it with a selfish motive, if the work is good, some amount of good definitely will be done in the world. And if I do it with the idea, for instance, if I do, if I do this good work, people will appreciate what I'm doing. Or if I do this good work, I'll go to heaven. So I might have these self-interest involved in the work that I do. And surely it will yield. It will yield results to people I serve and it will bring benefit to me as well. That is the whole idea about karma. You do good work, produce good karma. You do bad work, bad karma. But if I do the same work, good work, but without seeking any personal benefit for myself, then instead of producing good karma, it goes to purify my heart. And a pure heart, a, a healthy mind, that is what makes it fit for a good practice of meditation. And because we need a healthy mind for meditation practice, meditation is not a solution for mental illness. Sometimes some people are under the impression that if, I, if, uh, if someone has a mental illness or if there is a issues in the mind, all that they need to do is just meditate and everything is going to be fine. Uh, probably not. Um, in fact, there is even a danger. If the mind is unhealthy beyond a certain limit, then spiritual practice, any kind of spiritual practice, may make that condition worse rather than benefit the person. Because any kind of, uh, there's a lot of scope for self-deception and hallucinations and, and, uh, and just imagining, imagining everything. And therefore, I think it's helpful to recognize that meditation is strictly a spiritual practice. Um, and we need a relatively healthy mind to start, even start the practice properly. Another preparation for meditative practice is the practice of prayer. In some sense, it is possible to say that the first natural 
practice for a spiritual seeker is a practice of prayer. Prayer is nothing but a form of asking. Just as a little baby or a little child, when he or she needs something, wants something, usually when we are very little, very young, if we need something, all that we do is we go to our parents and we ask them. And we ask them because we trust that they're capable of giving what I need. We ask them because we love them and they love us. Now, when we have that kind of a relationship with God, then when I need something, it would seem natural that I would ask God for it. And so therefore, prayer is often seen as a form of asking. And so the closer the relationship I develop with whichever aspect of the divine that my mind is able to relate to, the more powerful that practice of prayer becomes. So prayer is not some kind of a magic. It's just, it's just a very natural response of the human mind to the existence of this benevolent divine presence, whom we can personify in the form of God the Father, God the Mother, or even God as a friend. I mean, there are any number of ways we could relate with the divine. But once that relationship is established, when we have that, that trust, that love, that faith, then, then prayer is the natural result. And oftentimes we have seen in our own lives that when we pray for something and our prayers are answered, now when we say when our prayers are answered, it usually means with a yes. And I've said this before, no is an answer. So if I ask for something and don't get it, well, our normal belief is, well, God didn't answer my prayers. But a devotee will say, no, God answered my prayer with a no, which is what parents will do. We don't generally give anything and everything that a child asks for. Children might ask for things, but if the parents determine that it's not good for the child, they will say no. That doesn't mean the parents don't love their child. In fact, it means they love their child enough for them to say, I don't care if you're a little bit mad at me, but that's not good for you. In any case, so, but generally, we, we are not so happy with the God saying no to us. But whenever God says yes, and we find our prayers are answered with a yes, um, several things happen. The first thing that happens is our faith becomes a little bit stronger. So as spiritual seekers, every one of us has faith in our heart. Otherwise, our spirituality is not worth the name. But that seed of faith in the heart has to grow, has to become stronger, has to be nourished. And every time we pray and we somehow seem to feel the response, then that faith becomes stronger. That there is, there is a, this higher being about whom I may know nothing other than what I have read about. But that being exists. So first our faith becomes strong, our faith becomes uh, deep and stable. But second, we also feel very grateful. And as parents and grandparents, you would have seen this. Your, your children or grandchildren ask you for something and you give it to them. And immediately after that, if you ask them to do something for you, they'll generally do it. Because there's a heart, the heart is filled with gratitude. You want to do something for them. And so worship is exactly that. So worship becomes a meaningful practice when one has practiced prayer for a while and has actually experienced that there is this divine presence which responds to the prayer of my heart. And the natural consequence of that experience is I then make an offering to God. And therefore, although worships in different traditions can take different forms, uh, they usually involve, at least partly or wholly, some form of giving. Now, the, the worships, the pujas that we do at the Vedanta Center, you will have seen, we offer, we offer incense, we offer um, light, a waving of lights, we offer fruits and sweets and food. It's all an offering with a heart filled with gratitude 
when that heart has experienced uh, receiving something from the divine. So prayer, worship. When our faith has become strong, our mind has become pure as a result of practicing prayer and worship, then we are in a better position to start the practice of meditation. So if prayer is a movement from God to the devotee, will God giving me what I ask for? Puja or worship is a movement from me towards the divine in the form of giving. So both, a movement from the divine to me and movement from me to God, both bring these two closer and closer together. And when that happens, meditation as a practice can truly flourish. One other requirement to be successful in meditation is to realize at some level that we are alone. I have made this distinction uh, often about the difference between being alone and being lonely. Now being lonely is a problem, clearly a problem. A problem that is faced by increasing number of people in the times in which we live. But being alone is a necessary experience for a, for a spiritual seeker. See, whether we are doing prayer, worship or meditation, at the time I'm praying, there is just me and my God. Because at that time, while I'm praying, if I'm simultaneously thinking about my workplace and my family and my children and my wife or my husband, then, then of course that prayer is no prayer at all. So while I'm praying, I'm alone. There is me and the divine. While I'm worshiping, if that worship is to be truly a worship with an undistracted mind, again, it's just me and the divine. Same thing with regard in meditation. Oftentimes when we begin the practice of meditation, and many of us experience mind getting distracted, what that distraction really means is that my mind is, doesn't like being alone. Um, it's trying to think of God, but there's nothing, there's just darkness. So then it tries to grab on to what happened yesterday or today or this person or that person, just doesn't want to be alone. So. For a practice of meditation, we really need some amount of comfort level with just being alone. And so it might be helpful to practice aloneness, even if it is for a few minutes every day. Sri Ramakrishna used to ask his students, he said, find a quiet place and retire there now and then. And in, in, he spoke in Bengali, his native tongue, and uh, he said, he suggested three possible places where you could go to. Now in Bengali, it's, it's very, uh, kind of very catchy. It says, Mone, Bone, Kone. Uh, and which in English, it really means, um, Mone means find a quiet, just dive deep inside your own mind and be there alone. Or Bone means go to a wooded area, with all deforestation nowadays, it's not that easy to find a wooded area. But uh, since the last few weeks, I've been reading this book, Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. Have you read it? Some of you have read it? It's, it's a brilliant book. If you get a chance, read it. It's about the, the, the Appalachian Trail, which, which he, he walked into. So there are, I mean, compared to many other parts of the world, we here in the United States are very fortunate. If it's not that difficult to really go some distance and find a quiet place. There are national parks and there are lots of places where we can. So Ramakrishna said, find a quiet place, go to a wooded area. Or if neither of this is possible, at least find some solitary corner at your home or some room or somewhere where you will be remain undisturbed even for a short while. And the idea was this, 
getting used to being alone. Again, sometimes we are alone, but not quite if your phone is there with you. So it needs enormous courage to switch off your phone. Although we have signed so many places while, until you come to the chapel, a lot of people can't. Uh, so while in the olden days you needed courage to face the dinosaurs and others, nowadays it needs a lot of courage to switch off your TV, your phones, and just sit. That's, if we can do that and not get bored, that would be a practice of uh, aloneness. And aloneness was getting bored, I have, as I've said often. If you are alone and you get bored, it simply means you cannot bear your own company. Your company is very boring. So we don't have to be surprised then if somebody else gets bored in our company, because <laughs> we, we get bored in our own company. So if we want others to enjoy our company, it's also helpful to just be by yourself and see whether you enjoy your own company. Then the chances are that others might as well. So that's the first thing. A com some amount of comfort in being alone, even if it is for a few minutes. And then the second thing is Shraddha, that deep faith that God exists. I may not have seen God, I may not have experienced anything about it. I don't have any evidence, I don't have any proof. But deep down, it's not an intellectual conviction, it's not intellectual at all. But deep down you have the gut feeling, there is. There is some deeper reality, there is some deeper being. And one can feel free to, to imagine how that being is. But the first thing we need to know is, there is. Only if I know God is there, then we can figure out where God is or how that God is. But before being even sure whether God exists, all these other discussions become meaningless. Yet another important thing about meditation is to recognize that in the truest sense of the term, at least as it is understood in Vedanta, meditation really means seeing God. And if God, as, as many of the texts say, is dwelling within us, in our own heart, and if we shut as much as possible all the doors of the senses, the eyes and ears and everything that brings all the sensory data from the external world within, and if we look inside our heart, and if we look in the way we should look, we should see God. But oftentimes, we will discover that when we do all this, you go to a quiet spot, you close your eyes, you do this, and close, and then darkness. Alone and darkness. Then what do we do? What do we do if I don't see God? The next best thing I can do then is to think about God. And that is what most of us, pre-enlightenment, what most of us do, what we, most of us call meditation, is, is really thinking about God in whichever way, uh, whichever imagery or whichever concepts help us think about divine. At some point, and this is just a matter of direct experience, people have found that while thinking about God itself is not really meditation, but if I can continue thinking about God with single-minded focus, to the exclusion of any other thought. If we think about the divine, in, if I'm taking some kind of a form as a support for the mind to remain rooted onto the idea of the divine, then that's the only form that should be in the, in the field of consciousness of my mind. No other form. If I'm taking the help of some sound or word, which is what mantra really is, then no other sound, no other word, other than my prayer or my mantra, and no other form should be in my mind. Now what they have found is this, that there are certain forms, there are certain sounds, which have that ability, that if I can focus on them completely, at some point, 
that thinking stops and seeing begins. And so thinking of God to the exclusion of all other thinking is helpful because eventually it will mature into seeing God or realizing God. That is what Sri Ramakrishna meant when he said, pure mind, pure intellect, pure Atman are one and the same. What he meant was, when the mind becomes pure, the knowledge of God is the natural result. The threshold separating the mind from the spirit vanishes when the purity is attained. And that's what when we read in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So the only thing that is keeping the mind separate from the spirit is this lack of purity. And so one way of seeing even the, the yogas, the four yogas in, in the Vedantic tradition, all of these yogas can be seen as primarily methods of intensifying the level of purity in our heart. The path of knowledge, jnana yoga, it purifies the faculty of reason. Reasoning needs to be purified because logic is a is a tool that works both ways. We know that in a court of law, both the prosecution and the defense attorney are juggling the same evidence and interpreting it in in many different ways. So rational thinking, logical thinking is great, but that can take me nearer to the divine only when that way of that logic, that thinking, that reasoning is purified. Similarly, the path of bhakti yoga, the path of devotion, is purifying the power of emotions and feelings. Again, emotions are a very powerful force within us. But emotions are such, if they are not purified, they can take me either to the, my highest good, or they can, take me, they can take me to my own destruction. So if emotions are purified, if my feelings are purified, they can take me nearer to God. Similarly, the path of Raja Yoga, the path of Karma Yoga, both of these will purify my, my willpower. The so Karma Yoga will purify my willpower as it manifests through the actions that I do in the external world. And Raja Yoga purifies my willpower through the inner working of the mind in my internal world. So all of these yogas are ways of purifying ourselves. Swami Vivekananda often used to speak about three P's as, as essential for progress in spiritual life. He called it, he said, patience, purity, and perseverance. We need a lot of patience. It's, it's, and these are apparently contradictory requirements, and we need to combine uh, these, these it's, it's paradoxical a little bit because one of the things that we need is an intense longing to realize God this very moment. It's a little bit like uh, going on a long hike. So one way is to say, I am going to finish it. I'm not going to stop now. Or the other way is, okay, on the way there's a Burger King and let me just go and eat something and then rest for a while. And eventually I might reach but, but it's going to take a long time. So there are people who believe in a rebirth can say, oh, I've done enough for this life. Maybe the, the rest of it I can try in next life. So while we need that intensity of realizing that highest truth right now, right here, alongside that, we also need patience figure it out how it is, but that's what they say. And it's, while it might seem paradoxical as I express it, when we actually start living a spiritual life, we discover that it's not really as contradictory as it might seem while speaking about it. Finally, uh, just a few helpful tips uh, for a meditative practice. Uh, one thing helpful is uh, cultivating a good reading habits, and eliminating from our life as much as possible anything that takes me away from my spiritual ideal. 
again, this, this needs a lot of courage. This needs a lot of um, discernment. Uh, if we have a clear idea, or at least as clear as possible, of where I want my life to go, then it becomes easy. Then choices become easy. If I'm not able to decide whether I should do certain thing or not, all that I need to ask myself is whether this thing will take me nearer to where I want my life to go. And if the answer is yes, by all means I should do it. If the answer is no, I shouldn't. So that's again a test for how earnestly we want to reach whatever each of us sees as the goal of our life. Yet another helpful practice in meditation is to not observe our mind while meditating. Because it's the mind that is observing itself. And now, if I ob observe what is happening during meditation, then my meditation really stopped. Think about it this way. I said, in a meditation practice, God is the object, the focus of our attention. Now, while I'm trying to focus my mind on God, I'm also simultaneously thinking, what's going on in my mind now? Is my own, oh, today I'm feeling very happy, or today I'm not able to concentrate. This kind of uh, uh, an inner dialogue that can go within us really means at that moment our meditation has come to an end. And so while it may be good to analyze or at least reflect on how well, how badly we meditated today or in the last few days, but that can be done some other time, maybe after the meditation. But during meditation, it's good to not, to not observe how the meditation is going. Even if you are meditating well on a certain day, uh, don't enjoy that meditation right there. Because again, that will come to an end. It's like, oh, today I'm feeling so happy, I'm meditating so well. You think, finished. They just finished there. So enjoy after the meditation is over. Uh, yet another helpful practice is to consciously try to see goodness everywhere. Now, yes, we know, we, everyone realizes the world is a mixed bag. There are good people, there are bad people, there is love, there is hatred. Yes, we all understand that. Uh, nevertheless, to, for one's own spiritual benefit, it's helpful to not focus too much on negativities. In fact, to make a conscious effort to see goodness, greatness everywhere. And if we really make an effort, then we might be able to find something that is good or something that we can appreciate, even in a person whom we hate. You know, it's easy to, to see goodness in the people we love or people we like or people we agree with. But there may be people who just irritate the hell out of us. It's just like, we just don't like them. But these kind of extreme emotions of hatred or anger are the main obstacles during meditation. So one way of avoiding these extremities is to try to see goodness everywhere. That really is good for one's own, uh, not just a peace of mind, but also the health of our mind. Uh, there are clearly and obviously, there are benefits of self-discipline if we can have a regular routine, um, a fixed time, a place, um, and, and a, a specific, if you keep aside a, a set of clothes which you use only for meditation and meditate at the same place. Now these are maybe just small things. They are not like mandatory. It's not absolutely necessary. But on the other hand, if we try to do that, it, it really helps a lot. It helps a lot it's a little bit like if you are accustomed to drinking a cup of coffee every morning at 8 o'clock, then by the time it's 7.55 or something, your body mind is saying, oh, it's coffee time, coffee time, coffee time. It's a little bit like that. So if you kind of more or less decide, oh, every day I'm going to meditate at this time, then the body mind kind of gets used to that. Oh, this is the meditation hour. And it does help in settling down and meditating properly. 
it's also helpful. Uh, many of the, uh, you see the, the image of Buddha, and many of the Hindu deities, you'll find often kind of pictured or, or visualized as seeing, sitting inside a lotus. A lotus is often seen in Eastern traditions as a symbol of harmony, of peace, auspiciousness. And so when we sit for meditation, we should sit comfortably. In fact, in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, the, the, the sutra, the aphorism for a seat, it's sthira sukham asanam. So the a, a best posture is that which is stable, sthiram, and sukham, which is comfortable. So when we sit for meditation, we should just sit in a comfort, not so comfortable that you fall asleep. And therefore, of course, a, a lying down posture is not very helpful for meditation because a lying down posture is often associated with sleep. And that's why it's helpful to sit, um, but sit in a comfortable, not as if you're sitting on a, on a hot charcoal or just about to run away in two minutes. That doesn't help. So to sit in a, not only the body should be relaxed, but the mind should be relaxed as well. And finally, uh, one other helpful practice for those who want to practice meditation is to find a way to remember the spiritual ideal the first thing we wake up in the morning. See whatever, whatever can help you do that. If there's some kind of a symbol or a picture or an image you can keep next to your bed, so when you open your eyes, the first thing that your eyes see could be something that reminds you of your spiritual ideal. If you have a mantra or a prayer, again, even before you have gotten out of your bed, the very first thought, the very first word, you don't have to say it audibly, even in the mind, repeat a prayer or repeat your mantra. So to begin the day this way is very helpful. And similarly to end the day, before you retire, before you switch off the light, again, if you have something next to your bed, which will help you remind yourself of your spiritual ideal, again, repeat your prayer or a mantra and glide into sleep. Oftentimes there are people who have seen that if you do this before falling asleep, after a while, a part of you, that, that rhythm of the prayer, that rhythm of the mantra will continue. And you might discover that you wake up in the morning, even without conscious effort, that prayer, that mantra is still welling up in your heart. It's a little bit like if there is a big download to be done, you just start downloading it before going to bed. And then by the time you wake up in the morning, you'll find it's all done. It's, so in the background, the process will continue. So a repetition of God, Chapa, can be very helpful that way. So these are some of the tips. And I'm sure since many of us here have already been practicing meditation, we have been aware of many of these things. But it's, as I said in the beginning, it's helpful to, to refresh our memory about these things in order to, to strengthen our practice. And if we can do that, as the opening song we did, in, we can go to our own abode. And that, that's one, one of the questions, a big subject. We are not going into it today, but to ask oneself, what is my true abode? Which is my true home? And one way would be to think is that home is a place or a state where I feel completely free, completely at ease. There is no stress, there is no anxiety, there are no worries. So, and whichever way we understand the word abode or home. So that state by which I feel I'm back in my own place, that would be the place where we'll feel comfortable. And meditation is something that will take us to our own abode. Om Jananim Saradam Devim Ramakrishnam Jagat Gurum Padapadme Tayo Shritva Pranamami Muhur Muhur
next sunday for satsang our subject will be the worship of mother durga as we get ready for uh, the durga puja on the first week of october so next uh, sunday we will take a brief look as what is the significance of worshiping god as mother on wednesday we will continue uh, the study of vivekananda's chicago talks at 7:30 and on tuesday and saturday the meditation will also continue as usual let's conclude with a prayer now oh may the divine being who is the father in heaven of the christians holy one of the jewish faith allah of the muslims buddha of the buddhists dao of the taoists aura mazda of the zoroastrians the great spirit of the native americans and brahman of the hindus lead us from the unreal to the real from darkness to light from death to immortality may we be granted strength freedom and clear understanding may we learn to see god in our own hearts and in everyone around us may god bless us all and fill our hearts with gratitude grace and love om shanti 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 hi peace 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 be unto you